This is the story of Joseph Fells, a man who rose from humble beginnings to become a very successful manufacturer of soap products and spent almost his entire personal fortune working to achieve his vision of social and economic justice. The only academic biography on Joseph Fells was published in 1971 written by Arthur Dudden, chairman of the Department of History at Bryn Mawr College. A useful beginning to my effort comes at the beginning of Professor Dudden's work. He writes, when Joseph Fells died in 1914 at the age of 60, he was as famous around the world as William Jennings Bryan and Robert M. La Follette. The fact that he is totally unknown today were at best associated by members of the older generation with a brand of laundry soap, is a melancholy commentary not only on individual fame, but on the way in which social movements, which in their time enlisted the energies and multitudes of people, can fade out of memory. Even social historians and economists know little of the link between Fells and the single tax movement founded by Henry George. After achieving much personal success in life, Joseph Fells would become, to use his own word, obsessed with the challenge of solving the problem of poverty by the means advanced by the journalist and self-taught political economist Henry George. Fells was born on the 16th of December, 1853, at Halifax Courthouse, Virginia. His parents had arrived in the United States from Bavaria in 1848. His father initially sold household goods for a living until moving the family to Yanceyville, North Carolina, where he took over ownership of a general store and later became the town's postmaster. Over time, the family invested in land in the town and prospered. During the Civil War, Joseph and his two oldest sisters spent two years enrolled in a boarding school in Richmond, Virginia. His brother Abraham, who had served in the Confederate Army, left for the North after the war ended. Their father, who served in the Postal Service of the Confederacy, was pardoned under the terms of the Amnesty Proclamation of May 1865. In 1866, the family moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where his father established Fells and Company and began the manufacture of specialty soaps. At age 16, Joseph left school to join the family business, which soon failed. He then worked as a commissioned salesman for a firm that sold coffees. In 1873, the family moved to Philadelphia. Joseph soon established connections with the local soap company and three years later acquired the firm, renaming it Fells and Company of Philadelphia, employing his father and brothers and eventually bringing them into a partnership. Joseph met his future wife Mary when she was just a young girl. While on business travel, Joseph learned that a family bearing the surname Fells lived in a nearby town. Thinking they might be relatives, he sought out the family and soon began visiting them when he could. By the time Mary was finishing her high school education, Joseph proposed marriage. However, Mary decided to further her own education and the marriage was postponed for a time. They were married on the 16th of November, 1881. Joseph brought his new wife to Philadelphia to live renting a three-story red brick house on Franklin Street between 8th and 9th. About two years later, they moved into their own house near the home of Joseph's father. His mother had died in 1876. The couple's interest in the world of ideas brought them in the winter of 1889-90 to join the Philadelphia chapter of the Society of Ethical Culture, launched in New York City by Felix Adler. Joseph was elected a trustee, and Mary served as secretary. Joseph was searching for what Mary later referred to as a religion of humanity, one that stood apart from race and class, from creed and time, 
and asserted the brotherhood of man. As such, he drifted from his earlier religious ties to the synagogue. Then, at the beginning of 1891, a spokesperson for the Philadelphia Single Tax Club named G.G. G. Stephen presented the Gospel of Henry George. A series of discussion sessions followed. Dissension developed among society members, in part, over whether to embrace Henry George's proposals. Joseph and Mary joined others who withdrew and established a new organization, the Fellowship for Ethical Research. This brief notice of a musical program appeared in one of the Philadelphia newspapers in June 1900. The fellowship met at the office of the Single Tax Club. Disaster had struck the nation in 1893 as the economy collapsed and the number of unemployed increased to a previously unknown level. As the depression continued into 1897, Joseph embraced the idea of cultivation of vacant lots by the unemployed to provide food for their families. This idea for putting people back to work originated in Detroit under Mayor Hazen S. Pingree, a supporter of Henry George's proposals to use taxation to publicly capture the value of land. Nearly 1,000 families were granted access to 430 acres of land to grow potatoes, cabbage, and beans. Funds were raised from the public to provide the tools. Joseph had already become interested in the program achieved with the single tax colony of Fairhope established in 1894 on Mobile Bay in Alabama. In 1899, he provided funds for various projects there, including construction and operation of the colony's school of organic education. In 1906, Joseph expressed his support for the experimental colony in a letter to Tom L. Johnson, the devoted follower of Henry George, who was at the time mayor of the city of Cleveland, Ohio. He wrote, I have never in the remotest sense suggested that this colony is going to upset things. And while it may not have appealed to you as a practical illustration of what a single tax might do, it is a first-class beginning of proof in that direction. In 1901, Joseph and Mary had moved to England, in part to establish new markets for the Fells Naphtha soap. In this, he proved to be quite successful. In London, his circle of acquaintances quickly expanded to include many reform-minded intellectuals and activists. Joseph then began to develop support for the establishment of self-sufficient labor colonies for Britain's unemployed. He became a close friend and collaborator with the socialist leader George Lansbury, who later recalled of their relationship. The fact that I was a clear-cut socialist putting socialism forward as the final and complete system of life which would abolish poverty made no difference to our friendship. He did not object to socialism or any other ism, but did insist that free access to the land and all that therein is, was a condition precedent to all measures, either of reform or even revolution. In 1904, Joseph purchased a 100 acre farm to establish the first farm colony for England's unemployed. He then loaned the land to a group from one of London's poor districts. 100, quote, able-bodied paupers were put to work constructing temporary buildings for dormitories, a kitchen, laundry, toilets, and a reservoir for water. Joseph and others provided books for reading, games, for recreation, and a piano. He had become convinced that the establishment of experimental communities would demonstrate the validity of Henry George's theories. These included the Langdon Farm Colony in 1904, the Holisleek Farm in 1905, and Nispel Farm in, at Mayland in 1906. He also helped to establish the Vacant Land Cultivation Society of Great Britain 
By 1912, the society held 520 plots on 65 acres of land. Joseph soon met other socialists, including Beatrice and Sidney Webb and other members of the Fabian Society. Despite their efforts to recruit him, Joseph could not be shaken from his conviction that solving the land question took precedence over everything else. Failing to secure financial support from Joseph Fells, Beatrice Webb wrote critically in her diary that she found Joseph, quote, a decidedly vulgar little Jew with much push. At a conference held in London by the Sociological Society, Joseph denounced a Salvation Army scheme to sponsor large-scale immigration of the unemployed to Canada. He pointed to the fact that there was roughly 20 million acres of unused land just in England. Let us colonize our own country, he argued. At the 1907 annual meeting of the University Extension Society in Philadelphia, Joseph delivered an address on the need to educate the public on the land problem. His words echoed those of Henry George. The land, including its waters and its mines, is the basis of all wealth and the source from which every nation draws its new generation of strong men and women. In this sense, it is the determining factor in all national education. In 1907, Joseph provided a loan to the Russian Social Democratic Workers Party to enable the party to hold its international convention in London. That same year, he met with Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute, hoping to convince Washington to embrace the single tax principles. The effort failed and they did not communicate further. Returning to London, Joseph began to work with Crompton Davies, John Paul, and other single tax proponents who had formed the United Committee for the Taxation of Land Values. John Paul edited the group's publication, Land Values. A Scottish builder named Robert Pollock hoped to convince Joseph to stand for election to the House of Commons from one of the constituencies in Glasgow. George Lansbury approached Joseph, who declined the opportunity, even though Pollock assured him of victory. Arthur Dudden concludes that one reason was that Joseph was already at odds with many of the socialists over their failure to prioritize changes in law to achieve the taxation of land values. Joseph then involved himself with the factions of revolutionary Russians assembled in London for the fifth, and what turned out to be the last, Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Moved by their seriousness of purpose, Joseph extended a loan of 1,700 pounds. He did so knowing that Henry George's doctrines had strong support from Leo Tolstoy and hoping this would influence other Russians. As the conference ended, Joseph gave to Lenin a document explaining the single tax. Lenin never offered any comment. When Lloyd George announced his intention to have all land in Great Britain assessed as separate and distinct from buildings and other improvements, Joseph determined that this was the time to push hard. He put his name to article after article written by others to feed the newspapers. When the House of Lords voted to defeat the budget bill passed in the House of Commons, a constitutional crisis was created. Liberals unfortunately lost their overwhelming majority in the general election of January 1910. Even so, the budget bill passed and the Lords stood aside. The politics took on a strange character when Edward VII died unexpectedly on the 6th of May. The public for some reason blamed Lloyd George and the Liberals for so deeply challenging a nation's long traditions. Additionally, during 1910, Joseph traveled to Berlin to meet with Adolf de Mosk and other leaders of the German land reform movement. One indication of how important de Mosk was to the cause is that two decades later, de Mosk was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. While the results of the 1910 general election were unfolding in Great Britain, Joseph was on his way back to the United States on board of all ships 
the Lusitania. In 1909, Joseph had established the Joseph Fels Fund of America and a commission for its administration. He pledged an annual contribution of $25,000 for five years to support the effort. Tom L. Johnson came on board as treasurer with Henry George Jr., William Lloyd Garrison Jr., Frederick C. Howe, Lincoln Steffens, and other prominent single taxers forming an advisory committee. The March-April 1909 issue of the Single Tax Review included his report on the economic stress in Great Britain caused by the problems associated with Britain's system of land tenure. He wrote, The English are proverbially a patient people, and in spite of hunger of the most acute kind, we hear nothing of riots and general violence. But how long they will remain patient under the abuses committed against them by the rascally land laws, which are in force, can only be determined by how long they will be content to endure the conditions which abuse them and bring about their starvation. Later that same year, he lamented over how few people still understood the virtues of the single tax reform. Whatever success might be achieved, he argued, would come from campaigning for the less controversial taxation of land values, as was being done in England. He states, I have for a long time been watching the effects of educating the public in England on the question of the taxation of land values pure and simple, without talking about single tax, or the initiative and referendum, or the power of recall, or local option, or what not, but simply the taxation of land values. And I'm convinced that with all the agitation for the single tax in America, not one man in ten who could readily be brought to understand what the taxation of land values means could be made to understand and grasp what the single tax means. I ascribe whatever success we are having on this side to the demand for the taxation of land values. You see nothing else in our literature and the hundreds of pamphlets that have been issued by the United League. You fellows over there had better begin to think of this and change your tune a little. Years ago, the Delaware campaign was fought on the single tax, but who remembers anything about it except the few faithful? What he was referring to was the 1895-1896 campaign to get the state of Delaware to eliminate all taxation except for the taxation of land values. During the campaign, key proponents were arrested for violation of Sunday blue laws and placed in the Dover, Delaware jail, where they formed themselves into the Dover Jail Single Tax Club. An assessment of Joseph Fells by William Marion Reedy, owner of The Mirror, appeared in a 27 November 1909 issue of The Advocate, America's Jewish Journal. Reed stated, The one man in the world who seems to me to have the right sort of philanthropy is Joseph Fells. He is devoting his wealth to the propaganda of a philosophy that has for its end the restoration to the people of the opportunity to get along in the world. He does not aim first to educate people or to make people pious. His idea is that if men were made truly free of poverty, they would seek education and they would become, as we say, good. Interviewed in Chicago by a reporter for the New York Times, Joseph was direct regarding the aim of his philanthropy. Carnegie, Rockefeller, Morgan, and other captains of industry are robbers, and their millions are ill-gotten gains. We cannot get rich fast enough nowadays without robbing the public. I admit that I too have robbed the public, and I am still doing it, but I propose to spend the accursed money in wiping out the system by which I made it. In December of 1910, he actually wrote to Andrew Carnegie, encouraging Carnegie to redirect his giving. You have given $10 million to an international peace fund. The object is worthy. The donor's intentions are good. 
but a worthy object and a good intention cannot alone make a gift a real benefaction. Donations, no matter how large, to suppress evils, no matter how great, can accomplish nothing unless they should be used to remove the fundamental cause of the evils. The unemployed and partially employed population and the underpaid workers form a potential market far greater than any war of conquest could secure. To secure this market, labor need but be given access to the natural resources now withheld by private monopolists. The vacant and the partially used city lots and the valuable mining and agricultural lands held out of use for speculation are causing poverty, unemployment, and low wages. From 1906 to 1912, Joseph provided financial support for the Jewish territorial organization, seeking to establish a Jewish homeland. Joseph hoped that the principles embraced by Henry George would be incorporated. In a letter written to an acquaintance in Buenos Aires, he explained, For several years, the organization has been on the lookout for a country in which the oppressed Jews of Russia and other lands might be invited to settle where a measure at least of autonomy might be had. My interest in this matter is very great, of course, and grows as I see the constant cruelties which are heaped upon my people, they being defenseless under the Russian government. Of course, I have in mind the right kind of landlords, and my interest is not unmixed with my obsession in the direction of the single tax. The first single tax conference held under the auspices of the Joseph Fels Fund Commission was held in New York City during November of 1910. Regarding Joseph's commitment to the commission, the conference report stated, Joseph Fels has done very much more than he agreed to do. He has not only given more money than he promised to give, but he has given himself to the work. In the whole world, a more active and fearless worker for our cause cannot be found. Conferences followed at Chicago in 1911, at Boston in 1912, at Rondo, Spain in 1913, at Washington, D.C. at the beginning of 1914, at San Francisco in 1915, and the last one at Niagara Falls, New York in 1916. He and his wife returned to the United States in December of 1913. A major reason was family pressure to remove Joseph from management of the family business. Negotiations were handled by Louis Brandeis, the end result of which was dissolution of the partnership, transforming the company into a corporation. Joseph attended the fourth annual Joseph Fells Fund Commission and Single Tax Conference in Washington, D.C. in January 1914 and afterwards returned to Philadelphia where he and Mary stayed with friends who now owned their former residence, Earl and Anna Barnes. Joseph grew ill during their stay and died on the 22nd of February. He was 60 years old at the time of his death. The cause to which he had dedicated his life and fortune was to miss his presence immensely. Louis F. Post, editor of The Public and later an assistant secretary of labor during the Wilson presidency, spoke for many when he wrote, as speaker, as teacher, as organizer, as contribution solicitor, as advisor, he was incessantly active. If he had never possessed a dollar to give to anyone or anything, Joseph Fells would have been a serviceable and conspicuous leader in the single tax movement. In 1920, Israel Zangwill, head of the Jewish Territorial Organization, recalled Joseph's offer to make a $100,000 contribution, but a contribution with very specific conditions. Sympathetically disposed as I was towards land nationalization, I was unable to pledge the organization to the Henry Georgian principle because it was impossible to foresee the circumstances and conditions under which the desired tract of territory would become attainable, if indeed it would become attainable at all in a world ruled 
by unreason and by sword. Our first business was to obtain a territory. For Fells, the first business was to single tax it. A rather remarkable remembrance of Joseph Fells appeared in a book published in 1935, written by the socialist leader George Lansbury. Of Fells, Lansbury wrote, Another well-known Jew, the late Joseph Fells, with his wife, did a very great deal to make me honor Jewry. Keir Hardy brought us together over the land question. This little man traveled Great Britain, Ireland, and Denmark, interviewing kings, princes, premiers, cabinet ministers, bishops, and the clergy, pouring out his money like water, lending it in large and small sums to governments and local authorities, free of interest for stated periods, so that land could be bought or hired for the use of the unemployed. There never lived a finer or more selfless man. Arthur Madsen, a leading member of the single tax faction in England, added his feelings about the loss of Joseph Fells to the cause. It is too early yet to say how all the work and all the power of organization which he has so largely set in motion will be affected, but we must never believe that our progress can be permanently curtailed. His will, written back in 1903, left his entire estate to Mary. She vowed to continue the work undertaken by her late husband. On the 10th of November, 1914, Mary delivered an address in San Antonio, Texas called Our Equal Rights to the Earth. Joseph would have certainly approved of her message. Out of land, God expected men to make practically all of their livelihood. He intended that every human being should possess some part of the earth and that by resorting to it he could earn his living in the manner he saw fit. But history has not borne out God's wishes in the matter. Customs regarding land are really little changed from what they were in the past and at present the large bulk of land is owned by a few wealthy persons. The great majority of people who possess no part of the earth have, therefore, only one recourse. They must in some way recover control of what once property was theirs. The government of a nation, in its capacity as a representative of its great numbers of people, should exercise its authority over the few wealthy persons within its boundaries in such a manner that the vast tracts of land owned by them would practically come again under the control of everybody. This would be accomplished ideally by the establishment of the single tax system. Mary took time to pen the story of his and their life together in Joseph Fell's His Life Work, published in 1916. Mary succinctly explained his nature. He was not the kind of man who could be made over into the polite, urbane, self-effacing man who operates from behind breastworks. He was dynamic, out in the open, fighting with every emotion that caught him, but always with a heart tender, true, and direct. Mary was even more committed than Joseph to the securing of territory for establishing an independent Jewish state. Rather quickly, she withdrew financial support from the single tax groups redirecting the funds into the Zionist movement. Following the Balfour Declaration late in 1917, Mary instructed agents to begin purchasing land in Palestine. A new Joseph Fells Foundation was established to promote the settlement of Palestine. Her hopes were deeply spiritual, although she still believed that the single tax was an important principle for creating a just society. We have a mission to fulfill in Palestine. We must achieve a real brotherhood of man, not only concretely, but also spiritually, if we want to avert war permanently. It is from Palestine where real brotherhood is achieved that I look for the first proof of the oneness of God. So, when the Zionist state shall be established, let it be understood that the equal right of all the people to the land of the country shall be recognized. 
to whatever land the new government may hold title, let it retain title and let those who would use it rent it directly from the state. Let whatever land is privately owned pay into the public treasury a tax equal to the annual rental value, exclusive of improvements upon it. Let there be no taxes of any kind on labor or its products. In 1971, Professor Arthur Dodden wondered whether what Joseph Fels had undertaken was ever possible. He wrote, Joseph Fels could be dismissed as a man whose ideals for land and people outdistance his capacity to achieve them, except for the example of his life and the fact that the cause to which he devoted his life, the search for an end to poverty, still exists. The worldwide single tax movement founded on the doctrines of Henry George and nourished by Fels' Naphtha's prophets ended with his death as well. But neither human poverty, nor squalor perished, nor man's greed for land, nor pollution of the earth. Arthur Dudden's ending comments may have seemed true to him in 1971. I came upon the teachings of Henry George in 1980, and sometime thereafter the activism of Joseph Fells. Enthusiastic pursuit of the cause they embraced never disappeared. Yet those who carried on definitely felt like voices crying out in the wilderness. <laughs>